I, I'm always amazed when, when people ask me if I think about my audience, uh, you know, as, as if that were a question. Of course I think about my audience. And uh, I'm deeply concerned that my music is accessible. Forty years ago, when I was a, a student, a, a young composer, um, you know, the aesthetic was, was very severe. It was the era of high modernism, and uh, the idea of writing for a large audience was, of course, uh, very, you know, déclassé. Um, but things have changed dramatically, and <clears throat> now, you know, young composers uh, I, they have they have publicity uh, agents. You know they have press. You know they pay somebody to take care of their their press relations. They care that much about having an audience. Uh, I don't go that far, um, and I know that when I wrote pieces that were uh, patently accessible, pieces like "Short Ride in a Fast Machine," for example, uh, they were very controversial. You know my. Co Composer colleagues in 1985 or so kind of frowned upon a piece like that. But um, um, you know, my model has always been a, an artist like Charles Dickens, for example, uh, or Tolstoy, uh, or for for that matter, um, you know, Wagner or, or, or Verdi. I think it's possible to speak to. Uh, a large audience, not everyone, but a large, intelligent, uh, and informed audience, and yet say something that is both accessible and uh, deeply meaningful. I wouldn't want to be prescriptive. I want, wouldn't want to say that a composer should do this or that. And, um, you know, a young composer in the United States, Matthew O'Coin, has just written a very successful opera um, based on the Eurydice myth. So it's always possible to use, uh, you know, mythology that's two, three thousand years old and make it meaningful. Um, I've chosen uh, subject matter that really comes from my own life. Uh, you know, I wrote a, a Dr. Atomic, which is about the creation of the atomic bomb. And I grew up during the worst part of the Cold War when I was a, a little kid. Uh, and we had uh, nuclear bomb drills in, in my school where we were taught to hide under our desk uh, you know, to protect ourselves from a hydrogen bomb. So, uh, you know, a subject like that is, is, has huge psychological weight. Um, li likewise, Nixon and China, which is about the collision of, uh, you know, s social welfare state versus the capitalist market economy, as embodied in Mao and Nixon. And of course, the death of Klinghoffer, which is an opera, a very controversial opera about terrorism. So these are all um, themes that are uh, painfully with us every day. We wake up and and look at the news; they're there. And I think yeah, they've all risen to the level of mythology, and opera is a perfect vehicle to deal with them. Opera could be. Uh, a phenomenally powerful sounding board for people's uh, way of, of dealing with what comes at them every day. Unfortunately, opera has, has, in most companies around the world, it's become a kind of cheap spectator sport. I mean, this year, uh, for example, the Metropolitan Opera has, I forget how many, four or five Puccini operas. It's just, uh, it's like Detroit turning out Chevrolets, uh, and it has nothing to do with uh, the really deep meaning of the experience. Uh, that's why it's been a, uh, you know, one of the great privileges of my life to work with Peter Sellers, because he's always viewed opera as a, uh, a provocative, even a subversive vehicle 
for uh, an artistic and a very human and a social statement. Well, we who work in opera have to be very humble because uh, there are so many other very popular forms. Uh, you know, there's film and there's television and now there's the internet and uh, I don't want to say that I think opera is, is this you know, experience that's going to transform society. Um, I don't think it has uh, the sort of uh, large appeal that it had in the 19th century, for example, when a Verdi opera actually could uh, make uh, the government anxious. I mean, nobody's going to get anxious over a John Adams opera. Well, maybe not. There were people who got up, very upset about the death of Klinghoffer, but uh, I, I think that um, you know, people who care about opera and care about music, care about poetry and, and deep thoughts, um, really want an operatic experience that challenges them on all levels. And you know, that's why uh, people came from all over the world to attend the Bayreuth Festival, even when Wagner was alive. Uh, they, they knew that this was going to be an intense experience. I think that uh, Nixon in China has had a, a remarkable uh, shelf life. Um, and of course, you know, when it was first performed in 1987, the, the critics mocked it and, and thought it was a kind of cartoon. Um, but it continues to be produced. I mean, there, there are more productions in Europe this year, and I've lost, I've lost track of how many there have been, and there are more happening in the United States, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that. I think people are drawn to it because, of course, uh, particularly with the current occupant of the White House in the United States, uh, the idea of presidential power, of ego, of um, you know, larger than life uh, persona uh, and authoritarianism is something that um, you know, is very much on people's minds. So there's suddenly there's been this flurry of performances of Nixon in China. I also feel that uh, The Death of Klinghoffer is a very important opera. Um, I lament the fact that uh, there may never be another production of it during my lifetime because uh, you know, it's been deemed unacceptable by certain people. And when it was performed at the Metropolitan Opera, there was such uh, protest, much of which was, almost all of which was, was uh, massively uninformed. Uh, done by people who actually hadn't seen or, or even read the libretto of the opera. But unfortunately, politics being what they are, um, we may have to wait a long time before it's, uh, it's really evaluated for what it is. I don't comb the headlines looking for my next operatic story. I mean, the idea for Nixon in China and also the idea for uh, Klinghoffer uh, came from Peter Sellers. I actually am now doing an opera based on Shakespeare. Uh, and it's a story uh, that is, doesn't necessarily easily key into current events. It's Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, it attracts me because at my age, uh, it's a story about two lovers who are not kids. You know, they're not Romeo and Juliet. They've, they've both been around the block, as we say. They both have a past, and they do terrible things to each other as lovers, and then they uh, forgive, and then continue to do terrible things. Uh, Anthony is very much wound up in uh, the politics of, of the burgeoning Roman Empire, and of course, uh, Cleopatra is this incredibly intelligent uh, and very wily queen of Egypt. So uh, while it's an opera that takes place, um, you know, more than 2,000 years ago, it's um, continually relevant to our lives on both a very personal, intimate level and on the grand scale of politics and, uh, you know, the struggle of power between nations. Mm -hmm.
recently reviewed Pierre Boulez's uh, extraordinary collection of lectures that he did over a 20 year period at the Collège de France. And I wrote a long piece for the New York Times about it. And while I was reading the Boulez book, I, I was thinking about how radically things have changed since uh, the era when he was, uh, you know, coming onto the scene and uh, uh, promoting his, his worldview about contemporary music, where issues of style and purity of language uh, and the evolution of, uh, you know, of the musical statement was, um, you know, paramount in his mind and in, you know, the mind of, of, of modernists. I mean, you had a, a couple of those modernists who were kind of left-wing people like Luigi Nono and, and Luciano Berrio, but basically, you know, when I was a college student in the late 60s and early 70s, the whole issue was about style and about the language, the musical language. Now, uh, 40 years later, um, young composers uh, are, are much less concerned with style. Um, they're more, much more concerned with the social statement of their work. Um, we have a huge blossoming of uh, women composers in, in the United States, which is, you know, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful thing and, you know, millennia late in arriving. And many of these uh, women are uh, writing pieces that uh, are, are keyed to their experiences uh, in life and to the gender issues, issues of, of uh, sexual power. Um, and I think that uh, it, it, it's interesting to see, you know, the compass has just changed like 180 degrees um, where issues of style are much less in the forefront and issues of, I guess, what we could call content. Um, someone else might call it extra musical content. That's a debatable issue, but those are really what uh, are at the forefront. It's not unlike the situation in the 1930s, you know, when, when American composers were uh, trying to find an expression for the great trauma that the uh, depression was, was causing the society. I think the granting of the Pulitzer Prize, our probably most prestigious uh, cultural prize uh, in the United States, uh, to the rap artist Kendrick Lamar, is um, an, an example of uh, a real attempt uh, among responsible people in the United States to open up a lot of the institutions that have up till now uh, basically been controlled by guys like me, you know, white males. Um, that's been the history. And uh, it's been kind of a, a very, uh, you know, exclusive club. Um, and that's changing, it's changing radically. And I think the arts are leading the way. Um, there's a huge movement towards uh, expanding diversity in the arts. Uh, not just in terms of, you know, commissioning people of color, women, uh, any other kinds of minorities, but um, of finding themes, uh, you know, whether it be literature or drama or music that express, uh, you know, the, the deepest aspirations of people who for, you know, as long as time has been recorded, have been oppressed. So I'm very proud of that movement in the United States. Well, I'm very grateful for uh, the appreciation that I got uh, from audiences in France. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking uh, on this visit of my first uh, concerts here, uh, I conducted students from the Conservatoire in um, a piece of mine called Shaker Loops at the uh, Chapelle de la Sabon, uh, I think in 1979. And then I came back uh, and conducted Nixon in China at Bobigny. Uh, we had a marvelous world a premiere of my oratorio, which I made with Peter Sellers, uh, El Nino at Châtelet. And I've been here numerous times uh, on tour with the London Symphony, always very appreciative and intelligent audiences, 
what always amuses me about uh, about coming to France is um, um, people are still hung on the idea that I'm a minimalist. Uh, and, uh, you know, style seems to be very important. Well, you know, this is the city of style, whether it's clothing or literature or, uh, or music. But uh, anyone who knows my music well knows that, uh, uh, well, my early pieces, pieces like Shaker Loops and Nixon in China, were easily identifiable for their minimalist technique. That uh, since the early 90s, my music has evolved dramatically. I mean, there are pieces where the minimalist gesture is still uh, palpable. I can think of the two piano piece, uh, Hallelujah Junction, for example, and moments in uh, some of my other operas. But I've, I've always uh, uh, been eager to expand uh, upon uh, the minimalist uh, ethic, which uh, I think is expertly handled by my my colleagues, uh, Steve Reich and Philip Glass. But for me, um, I've always been r restless. I've always felt minimalism just a little too rigid. And I've wanted to find a way to expand it so that my language is more dramatic, more capable of shock, of surprise. And uh, also that I can write slow music because, um, you know, that's one thing the minimalists can't do is write adagios. But people often ask me about my titles, um, and I, you know, I love language, um, and I find, you know, the old-fashioned way of, uh, you know, naming a piece, symphony number two or number four, or con piano concerto, I find that generally um, kind of tedious. Um, furthermore, you don't want to write a ninth symphony because somebody else has already done that and done it quite well. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've enjoyed finding a phrase or uh, a word uh, to describe a piece of mind that uh, at times is, is a little wry, a little witty. Uh, other times I think it, it, it takes the listener in on uh, a certain level. Uh, in the case of my new piano concerto, I found this phrase, must the devil have all the good tunes, uh, in, in a magazine article. And I thought it was a f name of a Chuck Berry song, but uh, in fact, it's a phrase from Martin Luther. Uh, and I knew I wanted to write this concerto that it would have a, somewhat of a diabolique flavor to it because I wrote it for a very virtuoso and, and very glamorous uh, pianist. And, it, you know, it just seemed like a, a, a title that was waiting for a piece. The title, Must the Devil Have All the Good Tunes, uh, suggest some kind of uh, devilish uh, quality. I mean, it could be, it could be the sort of, you know, uh, formidable uh, virtuosity of a, of a great pianist, uh, but it also could be a kind of hard-edged, darker, uh, more sinister quality. And I, I think the, the first part of, of, of the concerto has that feel to it. I added a specifically kind of American flavor to it because it's, um, it opens with a, what we would call a very funky opening. And uh, you know, I take influences from a lot of sources, including gospel piano, uh, ragtime piano, um, the great jazz virtuosi uh, like Art Tatum, um, but also um, it's definitely 
a John Adams uh, style of piece uh, in the sense of uh, the piano uh, playing a lot of uh, madly repetitive and slowly evolving material. I think one of the real dividing points uh, between my way of experiencing music and, and what was uh, a very prestigious in, in my youth, uh, which was modernism, uh, is the fact that, you take for example uh, uh, John Cage, who had an aesthetic of, of trying to dissociate himself from anything that had been done before. I mean, that was part of the reason that uh, he adopted chance, tossed a coin to make a decision, was to uh, remove his taste and whatever vest vestiges of, of uh, past culture might be lodged in, in his uh, psyche. Um, I'm a very different kind of artist. I invite in the past, and when I compose, I, I have a very loose filter. Um, you know, I, I actually take pleasure in letting whatever has influenced me um, pass through my particular musical personality and come out in, in my musical statement. You know, you can see this a lot in, in some of Mahler's moments when uh, he kind of goes a little bit crazy, uh, like in the last movement of the Seventh Symphony, uh, where he seems to be just channeling all kinds of different music uh, in somewhat of a chaotic way. I think it's safe to say that Debussy is is just about my favorite composer. Uh, you know, I mean, he's my desert island uh, mind for many, many reasons. The subtlety of his expression, the uh, sonorities, the colors, um, and the way that he as a person speaks through his music. Uh, it's been a a vade mecum for me throughout my life. And it's interesting because, you know, I grew up as a clarinet player. Um, there is a piece of Rhapsody by uh, Debussy, but it's a, it's a small piece. Essentially, his great work is, is his piano music, and I don't play the piano, but <clears throat> I struggled through a lot of his piano music and his songs uh, with my self-taught uh, beginner's technique. Uh, to kind of internalize the music. And I've done that since I was uh, a kid. And I've always known these Baudelaire songs. Um, they usually show up as the first set in any group of, uh, of WC songs, but they're not that often performed. And when I first knew them, they seemed to shout out that they needed to be orchestrated. And uh, so I finally did that. And, 1994, and um, I've been very pleased to see that many, many singers have, have taken them. Well, you can't be a composer and not uh, both love and hate Stravinsky. You love him because he's such a great composer, and you hate him because he seems to have thought everything, uh, you know, and only left the rest of us crumbs. Um, you know, there, there's not a composer alive that isn't influenced by any number of uh, Stravinsky pieces. This particular piece, Chante Rossignol, has always uh, enchanted me. Uh, it's a, a very compact symphonic poem of about 20 minutes that he drew from his opera. And uh, what's interesting about the opera is that he began it before he wrote the great 
you know, Petrushka and Rite of Spring, and then he put it aside and came back. And the music that he wrote after he came back to it is substantially different. It's full of color. I guess today we probably could be a little uncomfortable because of, uh, you know, the chinoiserie in the music, but this was, of course, something that was very common during the Diaghilev period. And uh, I think this is a, 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 an absolute masterpiece. It doesn't get done that often, and I think probably the reason is that it's a very front-loaded piece. All the excitement is up front, and I think conductors uh, uh, probably don't like it because uh, the last 10 minutes are so quiet, and it, it kind of just fades off into uh, e the ether at the end. But it is truly one of my favorite works. It's, uh, I think it's the mood now, particularly in America. You know, there's a whole generation of composers that grew up listening to Pearl Jam and Radiohead and, um, you know, very influenced by indie rock, uh, by video game music, uh, by all kinds of different sources. I really admired Steve Reich when, um, when Kendrick Lamar, the rap artist won the Pulitzer Prize because it was huge buzz and music critics were running around the country saying, you know, well, what do you think of this? Hoping, hoping that somebody would say something controversial and everybody would say, oh, I think it's great. I think it's great. <laughs> and Steve Reich said, I don't listen to rap. <laughs> and, you know, it was just a very honest thing. You know, he's at the time was 78 years old, not interested. Uh, I don't, I don't listen to a lot of uh, latest music. If you ask me to name my favorite hip hop artist, I couldn't. Um, uh, you know, I, I grew up listening to a lot of jazz and of course, you know, the great rock music from my youth influenced me greatly. But um, I, of course, I listen to my own music a lot because I'm composing it and conducting it. And, um, you know, I'm in an age where I'm not afraid to say that my life in music is essentially devoted to the music that I love, and most of that is what we would call uh, classical music. <laughs> 